Again, you don't have to write these down because they're, I'm going to post all the answers, so feel free to skip writing them down. All right, so number two, uh, what's the strongest of the intramolecular interactions? And then what types of atoms do they occur between? These are uh, transient. These are transient interactions that, um, yes? Can I skip this? Oh, I did skip this. Okay, let's go back. Sorry. A uh, hydrogen bond. It, what does it take place between? So van der Waals interactions, remember, these are transient and they kind of just, um, they become between uh, different areas of high and low electron densities. Um, and so they have to be in really close range for these to occur. Um, and they're just temporary dipoles that are induced between the two interacting groups. All right, number five, why are hydrophobic interactions favorable? structured around something that's very hydrophobic because the water is not interacting with that hydrophobic region so it has to be very ordered so once those two different hydrophobic surfaces start to interact that essentially breaks up the water ordering so increasing entropy is always favorable so this is one reason hydrophobic pockets are good for finding And then the next one, how do enzymes catalyze reactions? This one has a long list of answers you could have given. Okay, this one's very open-ended, um, and this will be found on slide 18. So all of these uh, different ways that an enzyme catalyzes reactions, providing that surface, suitable environment, bringing the reactants together, um, positioning them correctly, weakening bonds in the reactants, um, providing acid or base um, catalysts, providing nucleophilic or electrophilic groups, um, stabilizing 
stabilizing the transition state, and then also lowering the activation energy, right, for um, reactions. <laughs> no, no, this won't. I don't expect you to um, memorize all of these things. All right, number seven. The two major factors that contribute to induced fit. So this one um, could be interpreted in different ways. Um, so the two that uh, I was looking for are size and correct binder groups and the correct positions. But um, you know this can be encompassed in answering like just the shape of it and orientation. So you know I'm definitely not the person that looks for exact answers. Um, you can only get it correct if you have those exact wording. So basically, you know, if you had some kind of idea and you wrote it down, then full credit, right? So um, for the open-ended questions, don't worry about, you know, memorizing word for word, anything. Just if the idea is there, that's all I care about. Right? So in this case, if we have if we have this aromatic ring over on, you know, this side of the binding pocket, but your substrate has its aromatic region somewhere else on, let's say, the left side, and it's oriented in that way, then obviously you won't have this induced fit happening. All right, the difference between electrophiles and nucleophiles. Uh, nucleophiles, so that will attack to being electrophile, they'll get attacked by the electrons from something else. So, for example, a carbon valence, whatever is attacking it, the thing attacking it could be the nucleophile. Yeah, yeah, so this one um, also has a lot of different kind of interpretations for uh, the answer, right? So um, nucleophiles will essentially um, have more negative character or extra electrons. Um, electrophiles have more positive character, um, also like Ken said, and um, it could be as simple as electrophiles like electronegative, or I'm sorry, more negative things, and nucleophiles like more positive things. A lot of different answers can be incorporated in this one. But basically, I just want you to know the difference. Okay, and then the amino acids. So I did, at the beginning, you know, I said you should know all your amino acid residues and know their, their letters and their three letter codes. Um, this is important, but I'm not going to test you on all of these. So essentially, you won't see any question beyond this next one, like, um, knowing five amino acids would be max. Um, they don't have to be the specific ones. Like I'm not gonna give you a picture and say name these and give me the letter codes. Um, we, this will play a more important role as we get into second half of this class. So it is important that you do know all of the amino acids and their different properties. But for the exam, as long as you know some and what category they fall into, okay? Um, and you know, I had a discussion with a student about one of the quiz questions. Um, sometimes they can fall into double categories too. So I am going to go back and look at that quiz question. But uh, you know, if, for example, if you say uh, histidine can be, or I'm sorry, tyrosine can, you know, hydrogen bond, um, and I'm not going to dock that because obviously it can hydrogen bond, but it's also aromatic. You know, so. As long as you just know a few of the um, side chains for this exam, that's good enough. And so number nine, this is a good, this is a good table to look back on, on slide 13, number nine, uh, question nine. Okay. All right, how is allosteric control important in enzyme regulation within biosynthetic rats? Kind of spent some time on this, but remember, so allosteric binding occurs not in the active binding site, and so products often from biosynthetic routes can come back and turn off one of the enzymes in that route. Um, but the reason it's important to be allosteric is so essentially there's sort of no competition between substrate and uh, whatever that is that's essentially turning off that enzyme. Four. 
And I don't know if you noticed, I did put some, I did put some small notes on all of these review slides as well. All right, number 11. What is the significance of kinases? They can activate and deactivate the enzymes. Perfect, yes. They activate and deactivate enzymes. Super duper important, these kinases. And let's see. Number 12, what's the difference between reversible and irreversible? Yes. Uh, reversible basically means the enzyme for usually with inhibiting, you're inhibiting an enzyme. You can turn you're turning it off, but then you can turn it back on. Versus irreversible is more like you're you're breaking the enzyme or just you're patching it, patching the inhibitor to the enzyme. Those who are getting here, reversible can be displaced, right? It can come in and out, essentially, turning off and are on. And, or, I'm sorry, did I say irreversible? Irreversible usually binds covalently and essentially can break the enzyme, and reversible can be displaced by the substrate. All right, um, why are receptors important drug targets? receptors, right, they start off signaling pathways. So a lot of diseases are caused by some dysfunction in signaling pathways. So receptors are good uh, drug targets because uh, essentially um, we can either shut down a pathway, make it you know, less hyperactive, or activate a pathway. So um, yeah, they're a good drug target. Number 14, how does phosphorylation activate or deactivate proteins slash enzymes? Uh, it, it changes the charge of whatever it's being attached to, and that can affect its molecular forces and eventually the formation of whatever it's attached to. Yes, very good. So for those who couldn't hear, um, that phosphorylation changes the charge, right? And that, can, that um, phosphoryl group can interact with something else and essentially change the shape of the active site or whatever whatever else is, is going on. That is on slide 33. All right, how does the binding of G proteins to GPCRs activate the alpha subunit? So in this case, um, the, uh, when the G protein binds to the GPCR, so this is on slide 35, it binds here, and so that changes the conformation of the alpha subunit and allows it to uh, release that GDP and exchange it for GTP. All right, 16. What is the mechanism by which drug tolerance and withdrawal occurs? So this is probably the longest answer regarding receptors. <clears throat> something gets shut off, right, for too long, then uh, more of those receptors are made. And once more of those receptors are made, that's where tolerance comes in, because you have to add more drug to achieve the same effect here. And then having that drug removed essentially makes it hypersensitive to the endogenous substrate. And that's where those withdrawal feelings come in. So that's slide 40. All right, uh, how is PKA important in drug absorption? Slide 42. 
Mm -hmm. Right. So depending on the pH of what you know, what area of the body you're targeting for this drug to be absorbed, right? You'll see a different ratio of ionized versus non-ionized species. And so changing that, um, essentially changing that pKa can change which species you have in which pH. All right, and 18, next slide. How is log P important in drug absorption? I'm gonna kind of speed up so I don't take, take you over time here. Um, right, so log P quantifies the hydrophobicity of a drug, right? So essentially, the more hydrophobic something is, um, the more easily it can cross a cell membrane. And then number 19 can be found on slide 45. These are the four major factors affecting drug distribution. Lipid solubility, size, plasma protein binding, and then organ blood flow. All right, and the role of phase one reactions during drug metabolism. So, oh, actually this should say, um, not just modification, but a polar group is added. Right, so uh, the phase one adds a polar group onto a drug, and it also allows often for phase two to occur. So those are two major things happening during phase one. All right, and then urine pH, we talked about this last week, right? If you have something that's weakly basic, in acidic urine, it will get protonated, so it's a lot more, it's charged, and so it'll be excreted really easily, right? So you get a lot more excretion of a drug, um, whereas when it's alkaline, it's non-ionized and it can get reabsorbed, so uh, you don't see nearly as much excretion of that drug. All right, 22, what is the significance um, in mutations? So on slide 51, we also talked about this last week. Essentially, right, if you have somebody that has an inactive enzyme, um, it, de it also depends on the drug itself. So let's say you have a prodrug that should be um, metabolized. Well, the person that has a mutation with an inactive enzyme, uh, you'll see a lot less activity of that drug versus um, some drug that's already in its active form. Um, then this person with the mutation would see a lot more activity of that. All right, and then 23, go over to slide 54. The important considerations regarding pharmacokinetics and drug design. Uh, we talked about this last week. And then the last question, um, one synthetic strategy to alter membrane permeability and its uh, disadvantage. So essentially you can pick from one of the three we talked about last week. So we talked about either adding like an alkyl group or some sort of hydrophobic substituent. Right? But then there's a disadvantage that it can it can be a little too bulky, right? Or you could have chosen um, removing polar groups, but as we talked about, um, sometimes that interferes with binding. Or usually, if something's unnecessary, it's usually already been taken off of the molecule. And then last, changing the pKa. So any one of those three answers would be sufficient for that question. And then changing the pKa, um, obviously this can also interfere with binding or interactions, um, and it might changing the ratio of those ionized to unionized. Um, if you change it too much, then you might not get a, a favorable ratio of those. Okay, do y'all have any questions? one reactions. Yeah, so that's either um, adding a, a polar group to, you know, that's usually what the reaction is, is adding a polar group to a drug, um, but often that phase one reaction is also required for phase two to happen as well. And then what is phase two different? Phase two is adding like a, like a larger molecule, like a sulfate or um, like a sugar, uh, glucuronide, um, yeah, so Phase two is adding like a bigger sort of macro Yeah. Okay, so number 23. 
screen. Um, so all of these were uh, important considerations um, regarding pharmacokinetics and drug design. So making sure it's uh, polar enough to be soluble, um, polar and like a good balance, right, to interact with binding sites, uh, making sure it can cross with cell membranes. Although this one, um, as we talked about last week, this one is kind of not as important, although it's it's useful, but you know, sometimes you can still get good drug activity with uh, interacting with receptors and transporters, right? Um, you want it to be sufficiently lipophilic to avoid rapid excretion. Um, and then again, this is most important, having that balance, right? Hydrophilic and lipophilic. Prodrugs are designed so that they're essentially non-active before they're metabolized, right? And then so once they're metabolized, then they become active. So if you have a person whose um, CYP 450s are not working, then essentially that drug will always remain in its inactive state, or like a large majority of it will remain inactive. So for prodrugs, somebody whose enzymes aren't working very well, you know, they won't see as much of an effect. Well, you can always e uh, email me, you know, if you have any questions, and I'll post this answer to you right now.